Hello everyone and welcome to Hometown Talents and Treasures. Our goal is to introduce you to people who in their own unique way inspire, empower, educate others in the community. And we have certainly a guest today that embodies all of those things. Linda Zimmerman is the Executive Director of Neighbors in Need in Lawrence. Neighbors in Need in Lawrence has been around for 30 years. In 2011, they served 370,000 pounds of food in the Lawrence area. How have you seen the face of poverty change in terms of your clientele? Well, because we're in Lawrence, it has, um, it's a pretty consistent face. I think we see more people now who are, um, I mean, there's a, there's a sort of base of the, the, the needy population. Uh, we're in the neediest neighborhoods in Lawrence. We are looking at the people who are incredibly poor. The, the, the number of people in this city who are need help is huge. What, we're, what I see, the phone calls I get, are people who you wouldn't expect to be calling. And so there's a, in the last three years, um, I was just reading Project Brids, uh, says that the number of people who have become food insecure, which is, means they don't quite know where their next meal is coming from, has increased 43 percent in this recession country. so that's a huge that's a huge increase during this recession and so what I see are many more people many more working poor but also many more people that look a whole lot like you and I people who have lost their jobs um, I had a young woman call she has a very nice house somewhere in one of the not not in Lawrence and um, the small children her husband died and all of her friends are saying we well, have to sell your house and sell your car and get rid of everything so you can live and she's trying to hold down, um, she's trying to keep her kids safe and help keep her kids secure. And she doesn't want to give up everything until, while she gets through the transition of figuring out what's next in her life. So she's coming to get food from us. Um, there are a lot of elderly. We have two pantries that just serve elderly in low-income housing projects. Um, everything's going up. I think that, even I'm looking, I was looking at our food statistics. The cost of food has increased so much that um, the same amount of money that we have in our budget buys much less food than it did three years ago. And so that, if that's true for me, that's also true for the people, for our clients. The, the cost of food is, is crazy. How are you able to meet this increased need? Um, obviously donations are a big part of it. What about partnering up with uh, other organizations or government grants? How are you able to? All, all of the above. That we've dealt with the fact that our government food has gone down and the funding, the, even though the funding is stable, the amount of money we have to spend on food is stable, it buys less food, is to really go after um, more and more food donations. We do a huge amount of work on um, sort of donor education. You know that, that a lot of our food comes from church groups and schools, and um, um, so we try and make sure that everybody knows that we need food. We've really increased in the last three or four years our corporate food donors. Um, we have really power, strong relationships with um, what used to be Colombo, now General Foods. Um, they give us yogurt every week. We get food from Panera. We get food from Stop and Shop. We get food from Shaw's. We get um, there's a wonderful bread um, bread distribution system that comes out of the distributors in New Hampshire. You know, and we're sending home. We're not sending home a lot of food. When we send home a bag of groceries to a family, um, there's a lot of kids that are being impacted. It's huge. And, and so you think about this generation, right? You think about this generation of children who are growing up uh, without food, and that must impact uh, their learning, you know, as, as we know, we need I worry. nutrition. Yeah, I worry a lot. I mean, they're coming to school hungry. Now, there is a lot of kids are getting food at school. There's breakfast pro free breakfast and free lunch programs, and that sur surely helps. As we come into summer, of course, those kids are not getting food at school anymore, and so we're struggling to make sure we're sending home more kid-friendly food, so that the kids have um, food to eat. But um, if you're not, if you're hungry, you can't learn, and if you're not well nourished, I mean, I think that a lot of the times the kids are not, I shouldn't say not hungry, they get something to eat. Um, one of the uh, Methuen pantry volunteers was telling me recently about a, a kid who was eating. Um, ramen noodles, you know how they come in a cake, the ramen noodles, and just eating it dry at the bus stop waiting to go to school. That was breakfast. Um, you can't learn on that. So we really worry about that a lot. And so that's part of the impetus of what has gotten us to really 
change our focus. You know, here, here you are at Lawrence uh, with one of the highest obesity rates for children, and yet one of the highest incidents of, of poverty and of hunger. How do you explain this? I mean, I, I think one, one, I mean, one thing that I, I, I certainly know is that um, unhealthy food, unfortunately, is cheaper. much cheaper. A, there's two pieces to it. One is, one is cost and one is access. Um, there's only one supermarket in Lawrence. It's unbelievable. And um, there's 76,000 people here. So that's, that we start there. Um, if you don't have a car, even that supermarket isn't accessible to most people. It's down on Essex Street. It's not close to where uh, some people live. Um, if you don't have a car, you're in, in big trouble. There's one at the Loop. There's one in West in Methuen, just west of Lawrence, and there's one in North Andover, just south of Lawrence. But all of those are an expensive bus ride or cab ride if you don't have a car. Um, so that that's a problem to start with. There's also a hundred bodegas and small stores. You have partnered up with some local farms to to provide fresh vegetables and fruits. Um, so it's not, so the people coming in are not just getting the canned, um, the staple uh, foods. And so talk about the, how that relationship started, what farms are you working with, uh, and obviously there's an environmental benefit, there's a nutritional benefit, an economic benefit, and so touch upon all of those. I can do that. We all, we all need to be eating more local food for sure. Um, I think that's good for the economy and that's good for our health. Um, especially as we listen to all the horror stories about what's going on out there with food and how it's genetically modified stuff. I mean, there's a lot of questions. Um, so a cup, we've always, uh, since I've been here in the nine years, I, I worried about healthy food. So we started going out to farmers and asking. Um, but five years ago, we actually had um, a meeting with a particular farmer who had been donating, a, you know, we, we had leftover food from a few farm stands. We had, we had vegetables. Um, but not a lot. And we got into a conversation with um, Scott Johnson, who is, um, has a fam farm. He's the fourth generation on um, the last working farm in Windham, New Hampshire. Um, and he probably can't really afford to, f to run the farm. You know, it's not a, it's, it's a, he's got a lot of land that he really couldn't afford to farm. And he was, he has a farm stand, he gives away some food. And, and we started talking and he's found his sort of, um, Calling. His calling in life. It's really very clear that it's his calling. He, uh, he's the first year he planted. We started talking. Let's let's you plant land some stuff. We'll provide volunteers. So we have volunteers who are up up at the farm two days a week. Um, and he plants and he planted in one extra field the first year, and we got about five thousand pounds of extra groceries. That's a lot of f fresh vegetables. Um, the next year he planted two farm two fields and. Now he's up to, I was up on Thursday because we're just starting for the season and I have a, an intern, I'll talk about her in a second. Um, and there's a big field of strawberries, this one, two, three, three big, four big fields now that he's got going, which is about four times of what he had going, plus his corn. And um, so we provide volunteers. They come up on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they weed, they hoe, they weed, they hoe much of the summer. It's um, a heavenly place to be. I, I love being outdoors. What a great place to be <laughs> I have, I'm, unfortunately, I find that when I go up there and I'm supposed to go up and just orient a group and go back to the office and do real work, um, that I spend the morning at the farm and end up having lunch sitting at the picnic table. So again, if you want to, if you want to go and pick corn, which is not until August, um, or you want to go and just be in the fields and help, let us know because it's a lot of fun. It, um, it, when we pick corn, we can usually pick about anywhere from two to 4,000 pounds of corn in a morning with 10 people. It's kind of amazing. Co picking corn is very easy and it's very rhythmic and it's very soothing. Yeah, it's and it is, and, and, and it also means that our van is full to the brim with, with corn and that goes a long way. Uh, so that particular farm, this past year we had 32,000 pounds of vegetables from that single farm. Along the way, um, because we, when we started this program, we really wanted to get more food, we were able to get a, an intern who runs the farming program, the Forest Foundation, which is in Boxford, and funds a lot of, pro a lot of poverty programs in, in Lawrence. They fund interns. They fund a lot of interns. And so we've been lucky enough to have an intern from paid for, a paid, paid internships for not in a nonprofit are, are rare, and so these kids get they get paid, they get great jobs. So we have, um, this year we have Anna Burbank, and she's 
you know, just getting her teeth into how she's going to do this. She coordinates all the volunteers, um, but that's really helped us. And so once we have a full-time intern for the summer who's doing nothing but looking for fresh vegetables, then they reach out to other farms. We have a regular relationship with Pleasant Valley Gardens across Which the street. Which is right across the street. We love Pleasant studio. Valley Gardens. <laughs> um, they are incredibly generous. Um, they grow a lot of food, and um, what Demoulis can't, can't, won't take, um, we get. Um, so we, we'll, we probably had 7,000 pounds of, of peppers and tomatoes and all kinds of stuff from Pleasant Valley. So they are, uh, they're a huge supporter. Um, the CSAs, Farmer Dave's CSA, if people don't pick up their food, we get it at the end of the day. So it's really the, the CSA members who are paying for food that they don't pick up that we get. Um, we have had food from um, Shaw's Farm, from Boston Hill Farm, lots of farms. And I'm guessing, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the people who are your clients, um, they have been used to buying um, junk food and, and, and living on a dollar, you know, a dollar going a long way in the junk food realm as opposed to the fresh food and, and healthy food stuff. How are you able to re-educate people to the benefits? I'm, I'm guessing there's an education it, component it, on that. It's a, great, it's a great question. I think that on the one hand, um, much of the population we are serving, many of them come from rural backgrounds if they haven't, you know, if they're not second or third generation in Lawrence. Um, and so, I, but I know that, for example, zucchini was not something that our clients knew what to do with. So um, two years ago, our intern uh, put together a cookbook. So we, we take the, we know ahead of time what, what vegetables we're going to have. We have a pretty, I mean, corn, corn, everybody knows what to do with. But zucchini was a little tricky. We get some funky, the, the hot peppers, I think our clients know what to do with, but um, the, um, um, Thai eggplant is another question entirely. So Thai we, eggplant. Thai eggplant. They're little. They're little purple things. Um, so what happened is we. So two years ago we put together just a little cookbook and it's bilingual. Every re recipe is in English and Spanish, and we hand them out at the pantries. We um, put up signs at the pantries when we start to have fresh food, uh, with a picture of what it is and its name in English and Spanish and a little bit about how it's used. If it's escarole or something like that, um, how you might use it because some of the stuff that we get from the CSAs is more exotic and even I'm challenged to cook with it sometimes. <laughs> How people can get involved and the benefits of volunteering. We always need volunteers. Um, we have, in, in 2012, we had 775 people volunteer for Neighbors to Need. Um, we've gotten fairly um, adept at, at making sure that when people want to volunteer, we have something good for them to do. The farm helps a lot. There's a, it takes a lot of people. I mean, we probably had 150 people up at the farm last year. Um, when you're filling in two mornings a week all summer, um, that's a lot of people. So we love to have, if you want to come, you like to work outdoors, work with your hands. We have plenty of work there. We have, we use all of the, all of the pantries are run by volunteers. There's one staff person who goes out to the, to the pantries, because the pantries are, again, scattered on the neighborhoods and the food gets taken there. There are, um, so the vol all the pantries are run by volunteers who, the truck arrives, they bring the food in, they unload the truck food, lay it out. Most of our pantries are choice so that people get to choose their food. Um, it doesn't mean that they get to choose steak or chicken, but it does mean that um, they can choose what kind of vegetables, what kind of fruit, what kind of, um, uh, what flavor of yogurt, whatever, so that so all the food is laid out. Um, on a long couple of tables so that people have choice and so it takes the volunteers to unload and um, it helps to speak Spanish when you're in the pantries. <laughs> We're always sorting food in the warehouse. Um, all of the food that we distribute passes through a single warehouse since so all the food comes in there and then gets sorted, put away, um, and then repacked and taken out every day. Um, so it's always useful for people there. We get phone calls often for people who are homebound and need food and we don't have anybody on call to do that. Um, we need food to pick up. Uh, there's a, I have uh, four teenage boys who pick up every Tuesday and Thursday night at Panera, and they are going to college in the fall. So we're looking for people who just want to stop at Panera on Tuesday night at 9 o'clock and pick up the bread. The kinds of things that need to get done are all over the map. Linda, uh, Neighbors in Need has been around for 30 years. You've been there nine years. Um, what's next for Neighbors in Need? 
what's down the road? Interesting, interesting question. We are, um, one of the little things that we're talking about right now actually is um, there's a wonderful um, documentary that's come out this spring called A Place at the Table, and it's about hunger in America. And so we are hoping to, um, we've just bought the DVD with the rights to show it publicly. So we are probably going to do um, a big outreach to get people to, I guess like the food stamp challenge, to get people to understand more about what hunger is. I think that where I live in, in, in my work uh, in Lawrence, I know how hungry people are. I know how hard it is to get food. Um, but I live in Andover and I um, also know that I have conversations with people all the time who haven't a clue who have no idea how hard it is to live um, on the other side of the town line, really. Um, one of the things that, so for us, it's really important we do a lot of education. The film will be a piece of education. The volunteer work, the community service, the kids, the kids who come to the farm, that's education for us. That's educating people about what it's, what's going on in the world and, and what it takes to survive. Um, and then we're, we're just about to embark on figuring out whether or not most of our pantries are in the morning, um, which means that we are less accessible to the working poor than we'd like to be. And because we've just explained, people are working and more people who are out of our normal demographic are needing food. We're talking about trying to open a pantry at night or weekends or in Andover or something different. Talked about it. it's, been, it, it's out there. It's what kind of reaction, it, I guess, it, You know, it question. shouldn't surprise me because, but I live so inside of the hunger problem that, um, you know, I understand it in a, in a very, very basic way. Um, I am always surprised by people who said, I mean, people, when, when there was a conversation about whether we should have a pantry in, in Andover, people said, well, there, there aren't any hungry people in Andover. Yeah, there are. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, there are. And they're not only the people that live in the um, low-income housing either. They're, um, they're people that have lost a job and their or their retirement benefits are not so good or they've had terrible health problems and they've lost their health insurance. Um, there are all kinds of reasons why people, the people that we deal with, maybe half of the people that we deal with are, are in chronic poverty. They're there all the time. Um, but the other half are not. They're people who come for a few months because they've lost a job and they have no other recourse. Um, they come in the winter because they can't get fuel assistance, and so they need to keep their money for fuel so that then they can, so they come to the pantry for food, and we encourage them, come to the pantry, get food, because we can't give you fuel assistance, but you'll at least have money to heat your house. Um, people come for a lot of different reasons, and um, I think that, yeah, a lot of, my, my friends aren't surprised anymore because I've found it, <laughs> I, I'm talking about it all the time, but I did actually at Thanksgiving it with someone who just was astounded at the notion that there were any poor people in Andover or there were people hungry. Um, and as we, Massachusetts is um, particularly um, separating the, the high income from the low income, the gap is becoming much larger in Massachusetts than it is in some places. Um, and that means that the bigger the gap is, the less the understanding is of the people who have that there are still have-nots. There's a lot of people who are doing well, and yet the unemployment rate in Lawrence just went up to 15%, which is twice the state average. So that, that that disconnect between how well the stock market is doing and how well some people are doing and how well the rest of them are doing is getting worse. And um, so we have to, it, we, we really do, we need, we need to educate people about the fact that people need help and stop making it such a bad thing to help people. You know, it's an interesting thing because here we sit, I, you know, what I do is very basic health. It's very, very basic health. But if we can help people understand the need um, to help people and that we have an obligation to help people, that's kind of, I mean, my, my religious values tell me I have an obligation to do that. Scott, the farmer, absolutely believes that. He understands that he has a calling to feed the poor. Um, and at, at, at great cost to his own self. Um, so the more we can educate people about the problem and the more we can educate the people who we have about the health issues and help them get healthier, uh, the, the health issues in Lawrence are just a crisis level. It's a, there's a public health crisis here. And uh, we need to fix it by getting healthier food to people. Well, Linda Zimmerman, thank you thank so you. much. And that's...
this episode of Hometown Talent and Pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us, Linda Zimmerman, Executive Director of Neighbors in Need. And we'll be back next week with another Hometown Talent and Treasure. Happy Sunday, everyone. <laughs> See you next week. Thank you.